Good morning, everybody. It's Andrew Elgersma here with Climate Field View. I'm the business manager for Western Ontario. And uh, we're pleased today, uh, me with a number of my colleagues, will be delivering uh, this spring how to with Climate Field View. Uh, well, we had anticipated on having a number of these in a face to face type of format across Canada. Uh, we've obviously been put in a position where now we can uh, deliver these remotely. So we're very thankful for that kind of technology. And uh, we thank you for uh, being flexible and joining us here today uh, in a remote fashion. We will target this from being about 10 a.m. until noon today. And uh, there will be a break um, probably about two thirds of the way in. And um, yeah, we just encourage you to also bring questions forward and uh, type them in the bottom right hand corner of the uh, pane within WebEx there. And we will seek to answer them best we can as we go and uh, possibly following the webinar as well. So on the docket for today, um, our agenda is uh, really want to go through a field view 101 section. Uh, really getting started within climatefieldview.ca and then talking about the field view app. And then the cab app, uh, which obviously we use in cab uh, streaming the data on uh, when we get into field view 201, uh, that's when we'll talk about some cab app reports, get into some deeper analysis, talk about the remote view function, as well as field view seed scripts and manual prescriptions. And it's uh, during that section, we'll actually have a colleague from uh, Bear Crop Science, Bob Thurwall, who's a market development agronomist and Bob will be talking a little bit about the science behind seed scripting in corn and then we'll have a look at a live demo in terms of the field view seed scripts uh, tool and and really see how efficient and easy uh, that can make it for us to optimize populations within a field so kicking off this is really the team that we're bringing you here so everybody here has had uh, some uh, contribution towards uh, both friday's webinar and today's uh, today you'll hear from myself on the left there uh, Daniel Demoisak, who is my colleague uh, out of Eastern Ontario, covering Eastern Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes. And uh, Lydia will not be presenting today, as she presented on Friday, but we do have Marvin Telsma, who's the product marketing manager and has been with uh, Fieldview for some time since it was launched here in Canada. And uh, he'll be going through the cab app section today. So it is our belief at Climate that the next breakthrough in agriculture will be utilizing data and analytics to optimize decision making. We believe collecting data at the farm level, visualizing it, analyzing it, using it to make decisions will really enable growers to make better decisions around specifically yield management factors to help push their farm forward. And it is our mission to help all the world's farmers sustainably increase productivity with digital tools and we believe that Climate Field View is a key solution to help enable that. When we look at the Field View platform value pillars, the first one is about getting your data in one place. Centralized field data management has traditionally been a major challenge for farmers, and it is a very complex task. Field View does that um, really in a, a simple and easy format for the grower to be able to bring all that data into one place so that they can start to use that data to make better operating decisions, uh, visualizing it, analyzing it, and doing so in a very simple and efficient manner, and then enabling growers to optimize their inputs. And today that's largely through data-driven seed and fertility, subfield insights and prescriptions, and we are also working towards looking at opportunities with crop protection in this field as well. So that's really what we're trying to achieve and help growers achieve through uh, the climate field view platform. We've all seen this type of scenario in front of us where we see the notepad holding data to the farm. We see the green star card, the SD cards, the USB sticks, and probably even some data housed within the hard drive on the computer. This traditionally has made it very, very challenging to really help use all that data and consolidate it appropriately and efficiently to be able to make decisions and then optimize inputs with it. And so that's really the, the challenge that Climate Field View is trying to solve. How we help bring help farmers bring data into one place is through connected cabs with the Field View Drive. So helping stream that data in the cab to the app on the iPad. Uh, we can also do that through data upload. Perhaps we've got data that's housed 
currently that we can bring over in a compatible file into climatefieldview.ca, which can then be used across the various platforms we have to be able to analyze and, and bring all that data into one place. And then through API partners. So an example of that would be John Deere, where we have a John Deere sync and we can bring that John Deere data um, pretty seamlessly right into Climate Field View um, as an API uh, without any USB stick uh, connection. For 2020, our field view focus in terms of product development is really on a stable and consistent enterprise solution. So there comes a time in a digital platforms life cycle where it's, it's important to stop building new features and focusing on enhancing performance. And so that's what's uh, been done here uh, between 2019 and, and for 2020. And so uh, we expect a very, very high performance standard as we go into 2020 here this year and uh, making sure that uh, the Fieldview product is working as uh, a farmer would anticipate it and uh, just making sure that as we scale this up that it's, um, it's very applicable and, uh, and the performance standard is high. From an engagement perspective, it's Fieldview Seed Scripts. Uh, this has been a tool that we've had for some time that we continue to house new data in coming out of our market development trials here in Canada. And um, we know that there are a number of, of growers currently that have an ability to use seed scripts with their planters. And uh, we really want to help enable that. And so that's been a major focus for us here for 2020. So let's dive in. And um, we're going to uh, focus on the Fieldview 101 section here to start. And I'm going to lead us through the climatefieldview.ca platform before we get into Fieldview app followed by cab app. So once we're uh, logged in, we can uh, have an opportunity to then um, look at the navigation and see that we've got fields, prescriptions, data, import. Uh, we also have notifications here. We're going to start with settings. And one of the first things we generally recommend is around sharing. So we recognize that most farmers do not operate only within themselves as making all of their key decisions and recommendations on their farm. And so from that reason, we've also made the ability for farmers to be able to share uh, their field view account, helping others recommend insights that they can find and opportunities um, for that farm based on their data. And so here we have an invitation that we can uh, uh, either put out to somebody to share with us, or we can recommend um, we could share with someone else. So if I wanted to share with my colleague, Marvin Talsma, as an example, I click on share, and I can uh, then choose to share my whole operation. I could choose to share a farm or I could share a field with Marvin. So if I wanted to share my demo field health field with Marvin and I wanted to keep it excluding yield data, um, so he would see all my data, but not my yield data in that case, if I was sensitive towards that, um, I can do that. I can then review which field I'm sharing with Marvin it's excluding yield data and I can go share. So now I can see the people I've shared with. Um, perhaps there are also people that want to uh, share with me and um, I could even invite people to share with me um, as an example. And so if I wanted Marvin to share with me, uh, I could also put Marvin's name in here and uh, enable him to invite to share. And now he has an invitation waiting and he can choose to uh, share with me or not. So that's a, that's a key start. I think the other thing to note is that if you're looking to be invoiced uh, by your climate field view dealer, uh, you will need to share with them as well. Uh, that really enables that process to happen. And again, it could be as much as your whole farm or it could be as few as just uh, one field with field health imagery, uh, no yield. So it's totally up to you how much or how little you wanna share and uh, just want to ensure that you know that this opportunity is available to you to uh, to really help you get more out of the insights out of climate field view we also see here that there is a uh, notifications button and uh, within that we can see the various notifications such as rainfall or new field health maps um, i'm going to go into settings here and uh, personally, I like to receive my imagery updates and 24-hour rainfall notifications by email. 
But if I wanted to get it by email and uh, push notification or one or the other, um, I can make that update here. So I know some people uh, prefer to keep their inbox uh, with a little more email. So perhaps then you wanna go to mobile push notification, but uh, I personally like getting them in my email inbox every day and just looking in the morning and, and seeing um, what has happened from a field health imagery or rainfall perspective. Okay. So we're gonna go over now to fields. And uh, one of the first things we'll wanna do is add a field. So when I go add a field, if I wanna start by searching for a specific location, so say I wanted to look closer to my home near Fergus, Ontario, and uh, wanted to find a, uh, a specific um, field, uh, we could then look or field and draw that boundary. So how I'm gonna draw that boundary is I'm gonna go draw and I'm gonna go, I can draw a polygon, a rectangle or a circle. In this case, I'm gonna draw a polygon and I'm going to put dots all the way around the perimeter of this field. And I'm going to seek to bring um, my final dots to the end here. And it looks like I've just got to make a slight adjustment here. And when I click the start, the dot I started with, then the field will finish. So now we can see that's finished. Um, I can actually make a few adjustments here um, and I can even click these dots. A uh, little dot will give me more dots and a bigger dot will give me fewer dots if I click on that. So just a little trick there as you're drawing these, um, it is good to be able to spend as much time as you can uh, getting these boundaries as tight as possible. Uh, it will make things easier when we're streaming data in the cab. Um, it's also important from a data quality perspective to be able to make sure that when we're creating C scripts as an example, um, that we've got those boundaries um, as close to reality as possible. Now, let's say I wanted to um, remove a section. I could remove a polygon similar to the way uh, we just drew a polygon in that field. I could also look at a waterway. So let's say that this here uh, was a, a grass waterway. Uh, we could then uh, double click that final uh, dot there. And if the waterway width wasn't five meters, but it was three meters, uh, now I have a grass waterway that's integrated in here uh, without having to get too tedious with a polygon as an example. So uh, several different options you can see in the remove category. Uh, that can actually take out um, some uh, shapes as an example. So, so uh, now that we've got that field drawn, I'm going to give it a name. Well, actually, let's just remove this area first and then we'll wrap that up. So here's, here's how you can remove a polygon as an example. Um, I'm going to undo that. Um, and now I, I want to give that field a name. So let's just uh, call this uh, field to one and the client name is myself and the farm name is my own farm and it's 47 acres. I'm going to click save. So um, within that field, now we are going to receive three years of field health imagery uh, that will come to us um, within about 24 hours. We will also start receiving weather insights, um, specifically rainfall notifications um, within that period as rainfall comes as well. So, um, so that's, a, that's a nice advantage to being able to then starting to receive data and start to use that data uh, really as soon as uh, we start to have our field boundaries inputted into Climate Field View. So let's say we want to look at um, what some of the weather insights are. I'm going to go to a field that I've previously uh, drawn in to field view, and uh, we can see all of the field health images here on the left, but I'm going to go to weather first. And so I'm just going to scroll to the bottom and I'm going to click on weather. And if I had planting information, it would be here. Harvest information would be here as well. 
And now I'm going to see the weather forecast. Um, so this is the uh, today's forecast followed by hourly, followed by the seven day forecast. Now, what becomes interesting is when we go to past weather. So we have an opportunity now to look at accumulated precipitation uh, from January 1st all the way to today is really the default setting. But let's look at the 2019 precipitation trend for this field. So this is uh, what happened from January 1 to December 31st. If we wanted to look at the growing season and, uh, and just move it ahead from January to uh, say May 1st as an example, and to close that off on December 1st, uh, we can then do that. And now it's just calibrated itself across the bars here. If we want to compare that to the 30 year average, uh, now we can see a trend line over the 30 year average and see what happened um, over that course of the season. So we actually had a bit less than the 30 year average over the course of the growing season. Um, so that's what happened in 2019. Uh, we can then have the daily amounts of precipitation recognized throughout here. So we definitely see there's some higher higher volumes on daily versus the 30 year average, but also some drier periods in between some of those. And then and a chance to evaluate the temperatures, highs and lows um, versus that 30 year trend as well. Whenever we see an icon like this book here, uh, this means split screen. So if, for example, we wanted to compare uh, 2018 side by side 2019, uh, we would have an opportunity to do that. And again, look at the same period. So if it was May 1st to December 1st, we'll apply uh, and we'll see that. And then we can have the 30 year average here as well. And so just gives us an opportunity to evaluate how was 2018 any different from a weather perspective versus 2019. And we, we can definitely see some of those uh, changes as we go through here. Okay, so we're going to close that. That's weather. Again, this will come into your data inbox on daily precipitation amounts, which is a nice tool. Um, but next, let's uh, look at field health. So first thing we see up here in the right is we can select the year, um, and then we can also uh, select field health, which is always under the in-season category here. And what we'll see on the left hand side here is an opportunity to scroll through all of the field health images provided. And you can see, generally speaking, um, there's a pretty good frequency. So they can come uh, with some gaps depending on how much cloud cover is uh, in way of the satellite image that's being taken. But generally we're trying to get at least one a week and they have already started running as of about uh, the beginning of March this year. So uh, we have an opportunity to evaluate that. Sometimes we'll see a, a big change as we go through here. Uh, and that's where we say if there's an outlier between say June 14 and June 21 here, which look fairly consistent to each other, sometimes it's worth clicking the true color and just seeing if perhaps there was something in the way. And it looks like there could have been a little bit of cloud cover that was throwing out this June 19 image. So it's always good to just check up on that as we go. Thing to note is that there are scouting images and there are vegetation images. The scouting images are, are primarily using the reds, the yellows, the greens to help indicate areas of concern or areas of high biomass. So this becomes very helpful when you want to think about which fields you should scout first or which areas within a field we need to scout and help understand what is what is going on with these red areas as an example or contrary why are these green areas looking so good within that field? What might have been happening in that area that would have caused that? Vegetation, um, this, is, this is really more of a um, measurement of the total biomass within a field. And so we see that these are um, all green. We don't see the reds. And this uses a, a proprietary system called the Climate Crop Index. Um, that is really a, a good measurement of biomass and it has a very strong correlation with yield in comparison to NDVI. So it is very similar to NDVI, but it is a proprietary process that uh, climate uses that brings it a little bit more accuracy um, using some various filters uh, that enables it to have a very high correlation to end of season yield. So this is just another tool to be able to evaluate as you go into the season 
and uh, and have an, a really good look at the total biomass uh, that that field is generating. So that's an indication for vegetation. A lot of farms are using scouting because it just helps call out those high and low areas uh, very easily and uh, can be a real good tool for prioritization. So next, um, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is bringing data in. So if we have data and we want to use that data, we have an opportunity to import it through our data inbox feature, and that is under the import tab. So if we click on import, we see the label is data inbox, and um, we have an opportunity then to look at uh, file compatibility, which will take us to a link in our support site, looking at if the file types that you want to bring in are compatible with Climate Field View, and we do take a very wide range. We also uh, need to bring these files in a zipped format, and so we have uh, a link here on how to zip your files. And then once we have those files, uh, it comes time to upload those files into Field View. And sometimes that can take a little bit of time and uh, and then you have an opportunity to assign it to the appropriate fields and uh, and bring it in. The other opportunity is around the API we have with my John Deere. So if you have a my John Deere account, we can connect those accounts and then bring that my John Deere data directly into field view without the need for a USB stick. So several different opportunities to bring that data in and um, really enabling you to help get that data all in one place, as we talked about earlier in the presentation. The final thing I want to show you within the web functionality of Climate Field View is around fixing data. So this is something that can only be done um, within climatefieldview.ca. And so we'll go into settings, and right below sharing is fix data. And what we're enabled to do within fixing data is fixing planting files or harvest files. So if for some reason um, we had some files that came in and had some incorrect data, uh, we would be able to go in and, uh, and edit that data. And we can choose the data we would like to replace. Was it a crop? Perhaps we planted a crop and we needed to go back and then replant a different crop. Um, or was it the hybrid? And um, so it could be that we had the original hybrid is missed, but perhaps the new hybrid um, was lightning as an example, and we could then choose to replace that data. We can also go in here and delete data. So if we wanted to delete a planting file altogether, we could do that. We have the same opportunity when we get into harvest. So it's, it's fairly, uh, seamless in terms of what it will allow you to do and what it won't. And um, you can see here how we can uh, go ahead and change crops. And there's a very long list of crops um, that we can substitute. So um, the platform is fairly flexible in that uh, front. Okay, so I'm going to exit here. Hopefully you've, you've seen how we can bring that data in, how we can uh, start to use field health imagery. And my colleague, Dan Demoizak, will go through field health imagery with more detail. And, um, and hopefully you've also seen how we can make just some brief updates to data to making sure that we're getting that data quality. So at this point, I'm going to now transfer it over to Dan. And uh, Dan is gonna take us uh, into the field view app and um, he's going to uh, give us a demo of it and how we can get more of, out of it into 2020 growing season. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. And just a reminder for those of you who do have questions while we're going through this presentation, uh, down on the right-hand corner of the app, you see the Q&A section. Please feel free to go ahead and ask your questions there, and we have a staff uh, who are ready to help you out. So let's get into this. Uh, we're looking at the mobile version of the application now, right? So we're looking at the, uh, the FieldView app, which we see over here at the top right, left hand corner, and the cab app. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with that field view app, that black one here in the corner. Essentially, this is kind of like the, the Facebook of my fields type tool. This is information you're gonna get out of your fields. Uh, this is more of a daily use type tool. You can do a lot of scouting with this information. Uh, you're gonna look at the rainfall, health, field images, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is also the type of tool you do, uh, you'll scout with all different mobile devices. So be it an iPhone, iPad, or even Android devices, this is the app for you. 
Now let's start right here in the rainfall corner. So we click on rainfall. I can see all my field boundaries. So as long as I've brought in my field boundaries, whether I've imported them or drawn them just like Andrew did earlier, uh, I'm going to start getting information in right away. So within 24 hours, I'll get rainfall information and field health images. So in terms of the, the rainfall, since planting date, so it basically if we don't have any, uh, any planting fields or any planting data, it'll default to January 1st. Once you do have a planting map in the system, it'll default back to the date of that planting map. And of course, we'll get rainfall per day since midnight, season to date, and compared to the 10 year average. Now, how does this get in here, right? There's no uh, weather station on every single one of our fields. So, what we're doing here is we're combining local weather stations and radar maps and estimating the amount of rainfall for each one of those field boundaries within a square kilometer of accuracy. Now, this is a great tool, right? If we can look at, say, yesterday, I click from yesterday, I sort by lowest to smallest. Here I have 11, 12, and so on millimeters. That's roughly half an inch. So I know that if it stops raining today, I don't have any more rain today, half an inch, I may be able to get my fields this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Whereas if I sort the other way around, I'm looking here, I'm closer to an inch of rain in those fields. I might want to give it a couple more days before putting equipment in that field or before scouting those fields. It's a way to really prioritize your time in terms of which field you want to visit today uh, without actually having to get up in that pickup truck and driving to those fields um, you know, every single time. Since midnight, same idea. It's a little more precise in terms of, you know, since midnight of last night, can I get back in that field? Is there a little bit of moisture in there? I see that it hasn't rained a whole lot overnight. Um, so those fields might dry up a little quicker than I expected. That's great. However, season to date gives us a lot more perspective in terms, you know, from planting date to current day. And it's a lot more accurate in terms of, of uh, corrections made in the, the platform. So every 72 hours, we do correct the model based on local weather stations to get a lot more precision in that model. And of course, then we can convert to a 10-year average. Are we really in a drought situation? Do we have too much moisture? Uh, this is a situation where you can probably use it for insurance purposes. This is excellent information. Further, we have this radar option here. Click on the radar. You see our radar information uh, in the next four hours. So once again, it has to load up through a few minutes here, but essentially you get the next four hours uh, for the last 24 hours and so on and so forth. And again, it's about prioritizing your time. Do I have time to go out and spray? Do I have time to go out and scout? Uh, has there been a lot of rain in that particular field over the last 24 hours? Can I actually do work in that field? So that's how we're going to use these tools right here. Let me go ahead and close that screen here at the top right hand corner. And I want to go back to my main screen. To do so, I've got two options. I can either hit the back button here on the top corner or down here at the overview section. So let's just go ahead and click on there. Now, uh, looking at my operations, there's a couple of ways to look at it. I can see the overall rainfall, overall field health and yield analysis. And also there's a field section down here on the bottom. If I click on the fields, I can see it, each field in my farm and I can actually select every one of those particular fields if I feel like it. Now let's go back to our overview. We've, cur we've covered rainfall. Now I wanna get into the field health images. Now exactly what are we looking at here? I normally like to look at vegetation first, right? Click on vegetation. And what we're seeing is satellite imagery uh, of our fields. In other words, we're looking at biomass, like Andrew explained earlier. It's basically anything that grows, any green matter in our field, any kind of biomass will start showing up in different colors here. What I like about this vegetation tab, however, is we can compare every field to each other. They're on the same scale. Basically, if we see some grays and browns, grays and browns on this side as well, there's very little to no biomass whatsoever in that field. It could be completely dried out plants or tilled fields. There's really nothing growing in that particular field. As we start seeing some yellows and greens, we see either start to grow some more, uh, some seedlings maybe coming out of the ground or plant matter that's dying, right? Might be late in fall, we're seeing the soybeans and, and corn dry down. Uh, this is how we can actually estimate what's going on in these fields. And as the season progresses, we start getting more and more green. Of course, that's all biomass. It really comes up to the surface. The way we use these maps, again, it's about prioritizing your time. If I were to scout two or three fields today, right, I've got to work in the shop this afternoon, I've got to go run errands, I've got other things to do today, but I have time to maybe see two or three top fields. Which ones should I go check? Well, seeing here, my field number one is pretty much dry. There's not much going on. Field number two might be interesting, right? So I look at image on March 22nd. There's some biomass. I'm assuming it might be a hay field. And I see a couple of green spots coming out of there. That might be interesting, though. That could be weeds. That could be... Uh, the, the hay fields coming back out and maybe some some dead spots in, in that uh, those hay fields, something I might want to check out. So prioritizing that one, 
over something like this. This looks relatively uniform. Uh, might not need a whole lot of, of uh, looking at today. Maybe I'll go there tomorrow. This one, however, I see a little spot in the bottom corner. Again, might be weeds, might be something coming out. Let's go take a peek so I could prioritize my time. But what do we really want to focus in? We really want to dial up the, uh, the contrast in that. We're going to click on that scouting button. What scouting does is basically turns up the contrast, brings out the high and low spots for each one of these fields on their own particular scale. So now we cannot compare field by field, side by side. What we could be looking at is a potential of a field like this one. We see the dark green spots versus the red spots. There could be half an inch to an inch of difference, right? There might be something sprouting in that field, a little bit of weeds, uh, and the rest of the vegetation is relatively close to it, but a little bit lower. Whereas a field, something like, I don't know, let's grab this one here. Could be mid season and we've got some really great spots and a lot of you know animal damage around the perimeter here. We would have a lot of deer or bears out there and just devastating that corn. So they give a huge amount of difference. All this means is that these are points of interest. Again, a matter of saving time. Where in that field am I going to go scout, right? If I'm looking at my field number two, instead of zigzagging across that field and potentially missing some of these spots, I know exactly where I want to focus my time. There's a couple of high spots and a couple of low spots. We'll dig into that in a second. Uh, but I do want to show you some examples of how we can use these particular maps. Now, in the interest of being able to share the information, I'm just going to click over to my own account. So this is how Andrew is saying, if we are able to share information, I'm able to go into other people's accounts who have shared with me. So in other words, let's say I'm the agronomist and Mr. Dan Demwasek was the producer who has shared it into his farms with me. I can go ahead and start looking at these particular locations here. I'm going to go ahead and click on my farm down here, R1A. And a brief example was I got a history of information here about 2018 soybeans. And how do we use these maps? So if I scroll down into here on the left hand side, let's go to July 30th. Now, here's a field health image where I've got that scouting, that, you know, that, that scouting image, and it's pulling up the highs and lows of that field. And there's certain points of interest. So if I'm going to go scout that field, I'm likely going to go ahead and park my truck here at the farm and start walking through my field. One point of interest for me while I was walking was this one here, right in that red spot. Now, what could that be? If I walk to that particular location, I'm able to drop a pin. So these pins here in the bottom corner, there's pins and regions. We'll work with that in a second. But I was able to drop a pin and say, hey, listen, I see there's a problem here. There's a telephone pole. So I was able to indicate that with a pin. I used it as a purple pin. And now I can let my custom combine operator or custom planter operator you know, give them information saying, listen, every time you see a purple pin in the field, that could be an obstacle. It might be a rock. It might be a tree stump. In this case, it's a telephone pole. We might want to be you know, more, more careful when we're driving around these. It could be an in inlet for the water. So great ways to share the information and use these pins. Again, it was indicated with a red spot. And that's what I saw. Here was the red in that field. So it's less biomass. In, in reference to the rest of it beside it. Now, walking that field again, I'm seeing some, some darker green spots here. So if I click on that dark green spot, I'm going to go ahead and inspect that. That could be weeds, right? Or it could be really good looking crops. Hang on, that was my pin. I just go, okay, let's go over here. Field notes, pins and regions. And it was a green pin right over here. So we see a great biomass, right? So basically I went to check out that area. Was it a weed problem? No, it was really good looking crops. So just a quick note, advise the producer, this is what we're seeing in this particular location on this time. Now, another way to look at these, is as I was scouting that particular field, I noticed here in the corner, if I click on this little red pin here in the corner, as I was walking out of that field, there's something that caught my eye. Essentially, I saw some brown spots on those leaves. Starting to see some issues here. And if we look underneath the leaf, and I zoom in, even with our phone cameras, we're able to grab some detail, but there's some spider mites. So I took an image of that, that uh, area and I said, spider mites detected, go ahead and save it. So once I've saved that, the producer whose field, who owns that particular field was aware that now there's spider mites in that corner. Looking at the weather forecast, you realize, you know what, it's going to rain. I'm going to leave it alone. It's going to wash away a lot of those spider mites. I don't have a big problem with that. Just we'll, we'll let them go. So I can tell you, not having walked in that field uh, for days after, that there was a problem. And I'll show you here. We'll go back to my field health images. So that was on June 30, 
30th, July 30th. And then look here, August, uh, let's say August 11th. Look what happened here in that bottom corner. So even without having stepped into that field, you know, this field is roughly 45 minutes away from my home. I know that the damage was a lot worse based on these images. Right? So this is a way we can start using these field health images. It's a matter of grabbing information, uh, marking it, placing it down, and then start comparing it to even yield at a later date. How accurate are these images, right? Can I rely on these images? Yes, you can. Now, what we're seeing here is a great example. Let's say this is a soybean field, and I see this red area, right? It looks relatively dry. There's not much going on. Again, less biomass here, followed by this green strip in the middle. So what I did is I went to ground truth these images. Can we rely on these images? So I'm going to park my truck right here on this yellow pin. And I'm going to take a photograph. I'll take a picture of this field. And what I should see is relatively dry, a little bit of green, and relatively dry. So let's go ahead and ground truth that. That's exactly what we're seeing. A great big patch of red right in here. So dry soybeans. That one strip of green we saw with those images. Again, back to that dry area. So we can absolutely rely on these images for scouting. Now, be aware that there's three types of images. We talked earlier about the vegetation, we talked about scouting, but can I rely on these images is a very big question. And the reason is this here. Let's say June 3rd, right? So we look at, there's a pattern here, May 23rd, May 30th, June 2nd, there's a relative pattern happening here. All of a sudden, June 3rd, is this time for panicking? Well, let's ground true that before even hitting those fields. So let's click on that June 3rd image, and I'm gonna click on this true image down here. There's a cloud. I click on the cloud, it'll actually bring the actual image of that satellite. I see it's a little bit hazy, right? Not much going on in there. Uh, let's try another one because oftentimes these images can be affected by cloud cover and or shadows. And there we are, there's some cloud cover. So that image has been cut based on that cloud cover. And there's a little bit of shadowing in here. Those images could be cut by shadowing. So we do wanna understand that there's different types of images here we can look at and to really ground truth those colors. There's another cloud right here, all right? Another way we can look at these, uh, these pins and, and regions, this is one of my favorites right here. If I click on these pins, how oftentimes do we do a, a test plot and just can't find these pins after the fact, right? The spray ran over them, they're buried under the ground, the 12 foot corn around them, and who knows where we can find those pins anymore. Well, now with my phone and my GPS, I can walk right to those pins. I took a picture of that pin, grabbed the information, and if we go here on the top right-hand corner, I can also make sure that my current location is showing, which essentially will be a blue dot. When I walk into this field, this little blue dot will, will follow. And I can go right to these certain area, every single one of these pins that I decided to check out. So um, that was for the, the pins. What about the regions? What do we do with these regions? What are these big zones here? Essentially, on the bottom here, if I grab the, re grab the region, I can draw, whether it's free form, polygon, pivot or rectangle, I can draw areas in my field that I want to inspect. So let's go ahead and do that. Say I want to see this area in this field. Knowing full well that I have a planting map and a harvest map in for this field, it'll bring out that data. So I know that in this particular area, I've circled 7.3 acres at 12.2 moisture, and I had 52 bushels per acre yield in that area. I also know that I had three different hybrids, one population, one elevation and one planting date. What is this good for? Well, I can start comparing different zones in that field, right? So if I close this, I wanna compare this zone versus say this one here at the top where it was all red. I click on there, it should bring up the information and 38 bushels per acre. So now I know there was a major yield loss in that particular zone and something I might wanna consider next year, right? Do I plant more or less seeds there? Do I put more or less fertilizer in that area? That's when we wanna to talk to the agronomist and make decisions on, on better uh, cropping for next year. And also, assuming I have, here I'll show you. I'll grab a map for my planting map, my variety map from this example. I did a test plot in this area. So if I want that information, I just go ahead and surround it. Uh, and all of a sudden I can get data very, very quickly in terms of what hybrid was placed where and what the yield was. So again, very, very quick for getting information out, whether it was planting depth, whether it was planting uh, varieties, whether it was, um, different fertilizers or fungicide trials, we can really map this out very, very quickly with this particular platform. Now, let's dig in further. Go into the overview, scroll back in here. We talked about rainfall, we talked about field health, 
Let's dig into yield analysis. This is where the rubber meets the road. So what this gives us is basically a highlighted information on what we've done in our fields. And what's important is we have accurate information. We want accurate planting maps, accurate harvest maps. And we can grab this information and pull out very quickly. Great use for this one is when your when your uh, seed uh, advisor comes over in uh, late fall and they ask you, hey, we need to book some seeds for next spring. What do you guys want? Well, I'm in the middle of working right now, right? I'm in the combine. I've got so many things to do. I don't have time to look at this right now. Well, all your information is automatically set up in the system. We just have to push a button. We already get this information. So if I'm looking at, say, my 2019 soybeans, I've got a list of different crops here. Let's go with our 2019 soybeans. I can sort either by field or by variety. So if I leave it in field for now, I know that I've harvested 137 acres so far of soybeans at 11.8 moisture, and my average was 62 bushels per acre. However, if I need to look at my fields a little more detail, I look here, my field number B2. You know what? Let's switch over to my other operation. I get great information down here. Let's go to my demo account. Now, same idea where in my east field, I've got 64 bushels per acre, where my north field is really underperforming. I'm at 44 bushels per acre. We can dig in a little bit further and we'll do that in a second. But first, let's go ahead and click our varieties. Again, this is where I need to pick my hybrids, right? So if that seed dealer shows up at the farm and I need to start picking hybrids in a quick glance, as long as I know my information is accurate, I know that hybrid 1.2 and hybrid 1.0 performed okay, whereas my hybrid 0.8 is not necessarily so great. We can dig into a little more detail here. We've got these arrows at the end. If we click in further here. Now we realize that maybe that hybrid is not, to, no, not at fault. Maybe it's where it's placed. So in my east field is performing quite well at 53 bushels per acre. Whereas my north field, it's way underperforming. It's at 44 bushels per acre. So maybe there's a problem with the field and not necessarily the hybrid. Let's dig into that one a little bit further. Seeing as I don't have my arrow here and I can't get a little bit further, then we go back, back to our field. And again, this is where I said we would dig in, right? We get our north field at 44 bushels per acre. What's going on in this particular field? Now we have our arrow. We click into here. And we realize no matter what we're doing in terms of hybrids, it's underperforming. There's really not much going on in that field. So maybe it's a fertility issue. Maybe it's a compaction issue. Uh, maybe we need to look at other issues. So if we want to really dig in what's happening in that field, we can go ahead and click on that map and try to understand a little bit more what's going on. So here, if I go to edit my map, maybe I want seven, eight, more, a little more detail out of this map. There we go. And I want to start analyzing this versus maybe my hybrids. So I'll split the map on the yield side. I'll just go back to my planting map and pull out, uh, let's say, hybrids. Now I see different hybrids are placed around the different field, and I can start comparing and analyzing what's working well, what's not working well. Maybe it's a population thing. If I click on my population, same idea. I've got two different populations. What's happening? What's, the, what's going well? Go ahead and draw that zone and try to decipher that. Across a couple of different zones, a couple of different hybrids, a couple of different populations, and let's really dig in. So within a few seconds, I get this report saying that each of these hybrids are performing oak, and at the different populations, same idea. So it doesn't matter if I if I plant a relatively low seed count versus a higher seed count, I'm not getting a ton of differences between these two uh, these two populations. So again, we have to start looking at other things within that uh, that season. Maybe it's a fertility issue, maybe it's a compaction issue, and so on and so forth. All right. And now, if I go back to our page, and I just want to give you a quick example of how to put all together. So now that we have all this information and we want to make our decisions for next year, how do we pull that information out? What do we do with this information? So we were quite fortunate. Uh, one of our colleagues here at uh, Bayer DeKalb was uh, shared one of his fields with me here. So Daryl Whittington, and this field here in Southwest Ontario. Uh, so we can click on there. And for 2019 corn, uh, he had a couple of different trials. So if we look here on the on the left hand side, I'm just gonna scroll down to the zones. You all. So essentially, he had blocked out these zones. We have a zone here with purple. That's where he put in some starter. And then the red areas here, those red areas is where I put no proline, and the blue zones is where he put proline. 
So again, very quickly able to grab that information. I can compare it to say our yield map. Call it the yield map. Harvest and yield. And it's a little bit difficult to see, right? Just with the colors. Colors are great, but I really want that data behind those colors. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that no pro line area right here on the on the field. And it really brings out your information from your combine, from your machinery. This is your details. And this is how you make a decision. So in this case, the area with no pro line yielded at 246 bushels per acre versus the zone right next to it, relative to the same soil type, or 256. And that was just the difference between that pro line and no pro line, or fungicide, no fungicide. It could be other types of trials, could be different hybrids. This is information we could pull up very, very quickly and make the right decisions for our farms. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Andrew. Okay, Dan, if you could just pass me the ball back here. Okay. Well, thanks, Dan. And I see that there are a number of uh, questions uh, that have been coming through. So uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, we're trying to answer them as we go here. And um, yeah, lots of lots of great interaction. So uh, at this point now, we're going to make a transition. We've gone through the FieldView app, and uh, you've seen everything it can do. And uh, really, it's it's taking some of what we can see on the website and, and enabling us to do a little bit more with scouting and analysis with it. And now we're going to transition to cab app. And so I'm just wondering if the host can now uh, grab the ball from myself and give it to Mar and Marvin's going to give us a live demo here on the cab app, which is used for streaming data and uh, bringing uh, more in depth analysis into uh, everything going on with equipment data and uh, the yields in our fields. So um, yeah, Marvin, looks like you're you're live and ready to go. So thank you. <clears throat> no worries. So can you hear me all right and see my screen? I want to make sure that that's working properly before we get started. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So as Andrew said, um, we're going to start now by going to Field View Cab. And this is the app that you will use when you are in your equipment in the field planting, seeding, spraying, um, or any other activity that you might be going on in the field. So we're gonna start here. This is the home screen, um, very nice and easy to know which button to click in order to get to where we want to go. Uh, so we're gonna start by setting up equipment. Andrew uh, has shown you how to set up fields um, by drawing them in on the web. We're going to go in and set up equipment. So you can see I have a number of pieces of equipment in my uh, account already. Um, we're going to go to the bottom and we're going to walk through adding new equipment and we're going to add a planter. So I click planter, go next. Ask at, it's going to ask us the model of planter that we want to add. Click next. We can search for the model or just scroll down through the list if we know it. So we'll select one of the new case 2100 series. Uh, here we're gonna select how those seed boxes are set up on that planter. So, uh, and this is so that we get accurate maps at the, at the uh, end of the planting and we, we can start to do that analysis that Dan was talking about. So center trailering, that's where we have seed boxes that uh, are behind the rest of the seed boxes on our planter. The dual is those inner plant planters where we have um, inner plant boxes that are mixed in between. And then that single, which is where all our row units are in that same, same uh, line dropping seed at the same point. I'm gonna click single, go to next, select my planter rows, next, row spacing, next, and then here we're going to select if it's drawn, two-point pivot, 
um, or a three point hitch next. And then we give it a name. So if you only have one planter, we can call it planter. If you have a couple, you might want to identify them uh, differently so that you know which one, uh, how to identify them when you're selecting it in the field. We're going to click next. And now we're going to set up a few other things uh, that uh, we need to do. So you can see there's a list of drop downs there across the middle of the screen. That's the information that we've already entered in our setup. But if we realize we've entered something incorrectly, once we start, we can drop down and we can change to a center trailing or a dual. Um, we're also here going to select the planting display that is controlling that planter. So here we'll select uh, Case Pro 700, and then we'll have the 2100 series rate controller. Identifying that rate controller is important because this is how FieldView knows that we are putting seed or any product in the field is identifying that rate controller. When that rate controller is engaged, we're going to start generating a map. So we've got that done now. And we're going to go to the left side of this pop up window and you can see there's a number of different uh, boxes here. So wheel distance. So this is telling me that uh, we need to identify where the, the wheels are on this planter. So it's pre populated right now. Um, and that's because we've had a number of these planters that uh, our farmer customers have entered and we're using that information to, to pre populate. You can go out and you can measure this distance from uh, the hitch point or the pivot point to where the planter, the wheels are lower. The trailing rows, so how many rows are trailing behind that planter at the center of that planter? Now we're going to give that distance. How far behind are they from that pivot point on that planter? So we, we want to, we want to make sure that we recognize this. Field view cab does not like zero, so we need to enter a number in here. So I'll just, I don't know what this is, but we'll just enter a number 230. Click done. And then it's going to ask us what our standard row exit is. So there's a number that's pre populated, and we'll leave it at that. If I have fertilizer, liquid fertilizer that I'm putting down with this, I can go in here and select which rate controller that that has, how many sections that we're using that rate controller, are they even or are they odd uh, or different section widths. So that's how we set up a planter. Uh, very intuitive. It's not going to let me exit if I have zeros, if I don't have any information entered. So we'll click done. I'm not going to walk through the setup of an air seeder. Um, because it's very similar. The only difference with an air seeder is uh, it will ask you if you are pulling a, um, a tank with it and how many sections or how many bins are on that tank. It's important to add that tank because without it, we don't identify the, the rate controller or it's not going to read the seed because um, that's where we need to uh, tell FieldView when to start mapping. And then a sprayer, same thing. If we, we need to set up a sprayer, same type of information is entered or a tractor. It's going to have us locate that GPS beacon on that piece of equipment because everything else that we're measuring is based off of these measurements. So if I were setting up a tractor here that's pulling my planter, we would locate that beacon. Uh, and then from that beacon location, we would identify where you know, that seed exit is and, and all those other things that we already identified on that planter. Here again, you can see for, for most equipment that uh, we have, we have measurements that are already entered. Um, so here we try to lay out what, these, what the measurements are. So A is our axle, the center of that axle and how far in front of uh, that axle the GPS is, uh, B is the height of, of our GPS beacon, C the center, so is it in the center of the machine, 
or is it offset a little bit right and you can see if it is offset we just click that button at the top there offset left enter the number of inches that it's offset um, we'll go back to center here and then we measure back to our boom or in a tractor we would measure back to the rear axle and then to that hitch point on a tractor in the application same thing we're setting up what our display is what our rate controller is and i'm going to leave this one as incompatible uh, and i'll show you what that means uh, a little bit later on in this demonstration but really you know i mentioned how important a rate controller is but if we don't have a rate controller but we have gps on our piece of equipment on a tractor tractor that's pulling any implement we can use that gps and um, set up an incompatible rate controller and manually tell field view when to start creating an application layer or a layer uh, in our account so we'll leave that there and uh, we'll go done so now we've got all our equipment set up, but we're not quite ready to go to the field yet. There's a few other things that uh, we can do to help us in the spring so we're not entering a lot of information. We can do that ahead of time on a rainy day or, or through the winter or when we're sitting down with our crop consultant. So we're gonna add the hybrids and varieties that um, we have planned to plant this coming spring. By doing that, I click settings and then scroll down to where it says hybrids on the left-hand side and we'll select that button. And here you can see I've already got a couple of bean varieties and corn hybrids in my account, but we'll just go down here to add new hybrid. And we can start typing and hopefully that uh, the hybrid that we're looking for comes up. So we'll type in DKC, 30, 43, or 44, and we can see a list of products come up, and we can scroll through that list, and if the product that we're looking for shows up, we just click it, and we can add it to our account. We'll just add that one. That's an old hybrid, hasn't been around for a while, but you can see that our list is quite extensive, um, many different brands uh, that are in our account. So we've added that list. We can also do the same for seed treatments. So Dan talked about different trials that you can locate in your field. If we're trying a, a corn hybrid or a soybean variety or a wheat variety, and we're putting different seed treatments on them, we can add those seed treatments to this list in the same way that I added a hybrid. Uh, and then when we get to the field, we can, we can select those different seed treatments as well. I'm gonna go back to hybrids because I, I missed uh, something that we can do when we're adding a hybrid. And you can see here beside that box where I typed in my hybrid, started typing, there's a scan bag tag. But if you have the seed delivered and it's on your farm already, you can take your iPad out to your seed shed and actually scan that bag tag. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna ask me if I wanna use the camera and it's gonna ask me to take a picture. I don't have a bag tag here, but what it will do is it will identify the words that it sees on that on that um, bag tag, and then a drop down will pop up, and you can select the actual hybrid that shows up on the on the bag tag to get accuracy. So that's adding hybrids in our account. We can do the same thing for applications. So if we're adding uh, a starter to our planter. Uh, as we're going across that field, we can add that here. Again, you can see that I have a number of them in my account already, but we're going to add a new application and we'll just name it. Click next. And here we can add granular or liquid applications. So we'll hit finish here. We'll add a liquid. And here I'm going to put down my weed and feed um, product. So we're going to go down with. 33 gallons to the acre, Hit done. And now I can add products to my tank. So here we're gonna put down some 28%. So again, start typing. Hopefully it catches up here. Here we go. So 28 UAN, and we're gonna go down with 33 gallons. And we're gonna add 
a product in the tank. So I'm extra. And here we're going to put that down at 1.5 liters per acre and hit done. Oh, shoot, I've got too many products in the tank. So I would either have to adjust this and add my liter and a half to my application rate, or if I go over here and switch to by amount, it will automatically adjust that for me. So now I'm going down at this rate. This will not change my controller in my sprayer though. So if I am only going down with 33 gallons per acre, I need to make this adjustment and make this 32.75 or whatever that number needs to be. I don't know what it needs to be, obviously. And click done. So now we have that product in our, in our list of applications and we're one step closer to being ready to go to the field. So I've gone back to my home screen and you know maybe you're working with a consultant and and uh, or your seed dealer and there's a hybrid that really fits a specific field so we can go down here to a field and let's remove these and we can start to customize what hybrids or varieties go in a particular field and again this will help us when we get to a field in the springtime with uh, selecting with fewer taps and fewer looks. So we're going to select a couple of hybrids here that we want to put in this field. There's seed treatments here that we're going to use as well. And I want to add that pre seed or that uh, liquid application to this field. So I've gone through and I can do this field by field. And just because I do this here, does not mean that I can override, I can't override this when I'm actually in the field. This is something that again, I can edit, I can um, uh, make different choices. For instance, if I get to the field where I want to put that decal 5026 in at the start, but I've still got seed in the planter, I can still map that seed that's still in the planter and then make this switch when the planter is finally empty. So this is something that uh, we, we recommend doing ahead of time. Um, it just, again, makes that list that we're going, to, um, we're going to choose from in the field a little bit different. So just Marvin, before- a question, a question came in here, Marvin. Can you remove hybrids that you are no longer using from your list, like last year's hybrids, without any impact on other sections of field view? Yeah, great question, Andrew. So yes, if I go back to that hybrids tab and you can see this remove button or remove all at the bottom, if I, I can click remove, so we'll remove this uh, soybean variety, it just removes it from this list. If I seeded that variety uh, in 2019, uh, it will still show up on my seeding map um, in my uh, report that Dan walked through in the field view uh, black app. So it just removes it from this list. It does not re remove it from anywhere else within our platform. I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, we can follow up uh, after, after the webinar. So before I get to connecting a drive and showing you what it looks like in some of that process, I'm gonna go to the map button. And if I click this arrow in the top corner, I'm going to click map options and there's a few things that uh, I want to call out here. So Andrew at the start of this webinar talked about creating field boundaries and the reason why this is important. And one of them is right here, uh, field boundary detection. So when I'm connected to my field view drive or my precision 2020 monitor, um, we're accessing that GPS. And because we have that location and we've got good accurate field boundaries, once I pull into a field, FieldView is going to recognize that boundary. And right now it's defaulted to prompting me when I enter a field. So a pop-up box will pop up asking me if I want to make this field active, if I want to start collecting 
my seeding information or my planting information um, with this boundary, I click yes. If I go over here and click auto, uh, it's going to auto select field. So I'm not going to get a pop up. Here it's basically telling me that you better ensure that you have accurate field boundaries so that uh, you know they're not overlapping because um, otherwise you're going to have information go from one field to another. So it's that's one of the reasons that Andrew mentioned that it's important to create those accurate boundaries and uh, and you can leave this on auto select. Or if it's disabled, this means that every time you get to a field, you're going to have to stop and you're going to have to go up to the top here where it says select field and select the field that you are performing that activity in. I recommend leaving it on prompt and that way you will get a, a pop up to show you um, what is going on uh, or which field you want to select in order to do your activity. Also down here at the bottom. Uh, you can see that there's a number of different uh, things that we can map and record, but you can see that uh, the planter that I have, uh, I don't have smart firmers on it, so I've turned off these layers that I'm not able to collect anyway. Um, if I don't want to see a seed treatment map, I can turn that off, and that goes for a number of, of the uh, layers that we collect. If I want, don't want to see my boundaries on the screen, I can turn that off. If I want to hide the pins that I drop, I can hide them as well, um, and just some different options. But um, that is by clicking the map options on the top left. Or if I click this box here, I also get the opportunity to edit map options. So we're going to back out of this for a minute, and we're going to connect to a field view drive. So just like connecting any other Bluetooth device, I'm going to go to my Apple settings and I'm going to ensure that my Bluetooth is on. And you can see here already that this is my FieldView drive and it's already connected to Bluetooth because I've connected to it with this iPad in the past. If I was connecting for the first time, it would show up here at the bottom under other devices as an, I believe an eight digit combination of letters and numbers. You would select it, connect it here, and then uh, make sure it's connected. Back out of here and we'll go to Field View Cab again. And I'm gonna go to Settings, Devices, and you can see that my drive's already identified here. If I'm pairing for the first time, click that. It already may show up because I'm connected through the Apple settings. It may be shown here already, but we pair that new drive and then uh, we tap to connect. And it should connect here with a check mark. Everything goes well. There we go. And we're going to go back and I believe, yes. Yeah, so it's going to connect to the most recent piece of equipment that uh, you've been connected to or you've identified. So here I'm connected to a sprayer. I'm going to go here down to my how to planter that we set up earlier and I'm going to make active. And all that means is that that's the piece of equipment that we're going to go to the field with. So it's disconnecting from my sprayer and we should see at the top that uh, it's connected to a planter and it's chosen a tractor that uh, I had set up in my account. Um, while I'm here, I'll also just touch on quickly this little guy beside the house. Um, with the magnifying glass, this is a feature that we have called remote view. So when I'm connected to a piece of equipment and say uh, the farm manager or my dad is in the office and he wants to see what's going on, he can click this and he can enter the, U, the email account that uh, of the account that I'm logged in with. And you'll be able to remote view in and find this equipment. So if I search for that, I don't know if this is going to work because this is the account that I'm actually using, but the piece of equipment will show up in that list. I can click on it and then I'll be able to view in on that map screen and see what's going on. Uh, it's actually a very nice feature to, to use to find out how many acres are left in that field. Do we need to send more fertilizer? Do we need to send more seed, uh, et cetera? So I'll go back 
and I'll click that um, the map screen. And FieldView is pretty good at identifying where we need to enter more information. So I've got yellow boxes here in this list on the left hand side. So when we're connected to a piece of equipment, we get more um, boxes show up on our map screen on the left hand side and, and depending on what we're connected to across the bottom. You can see my tractor and planter there in the middle in my backyard. Um, and uh, we're going to go here and we're going to select that field that we selected earlier. And I'm going to make it active. So this is what I talked about with the, that prompt. So if I were driving and I crossed into this field, this would show up on my screen. Do I miss to make this field demo seed scripts active? I click yes. So now it's active, but we still haven't identified what we're doing in the planter. So here it's coming up and it's telling me that I need to select something in my planter. Um, we can first select the crop. So if we're not planting corn anymore, we can select that. But if I go to select hybrids in the planter, you can see the two field hybrids that I previously entered uh, under the fields tab in cab app. So I can select them. So I want to start with field view 5026. It's across all 16 rows of my planter. Same with the seed treatment. So in this, we're going to add this, uh, we're going to be planting acceleron. We've got that across the planter as well. And we're going to confirm that. And you can see that in the top corner here um, that the hybrid and the seed treatment is listed under that hybrid box and it's gone green. It's also asking me to select my application. And you'll notice that my application changed or it removed from this list along the side. I'll show you how to bring it back in a minute. So we're going to select that application. We're going to put down starter fertilizer with this and we're going to confirm. So now we're ready to go planting. Um, so as I said, that application box disappeared. So if I go down here to the bottom to this edit and I pull up and I find it, so I can bring this over and I wanna look at that instead of singulation. So I just clicked on it and dragged it across. Um, the other one that I often bring over here is this drop pin box. So if I don't wanna look at these other metrics, um, you know, this one, it's assuming that it's a it's got the 2020 um, components on it with singulation and downforce. If I've got that on my planter, I might be able to see that on my other monitor that's in the tractor. So I've got drop pin there. And the reason that I like it here is, is that I'm as I'm planting, say I come across a blown tile or a big rock that we need selected, I can hit that drop pin and it's gonna drop a pin in that place that I just traveled over. So now I can give field view to my uh, son or daughter. They can go out in a four wheeler and they can go and find that rock that I've identified for them to pick up. The other box that uh, we can do here is create custom map. So if there's something that I'm doing in this field that I'm not able to measure, um, I can, create a custom map for this. So say I'm doing a trial on seeding depth. So if I bring this over here and I click this, so now I can do this and I can go three inch seed depth and click done. Enter that again. Probably wanted to leave the three inches out of that first one and just call it seeding trial or seed depth trial. Click done. So now I'm mapping my seeding depth if I can't capture that with, with my planter. So I finished doing that. I go back. I can enter a new zone name and we're going to go to 1.5 inch seed depth and click done. So now I, I plant for a while and I get that finished. And when I'm done, I can go up here to the top and I will have that, I'll have the ability to find that custom map if I have it turned on in my, my map options. 
Also, the other thing that we can do, and Dan talked about doing different trials. So if I go back to this top button and click the hybrid, oh, let me edit. There we go. And we're gonna add this Mazex hybrid to the to the planter. And you can see that because I've got two hybrids selected, it's asking me which rows is that are the, the two hybrids in. So that new hybrid, that Mazex hybrid, we'll put in the left half of the planter. And it's going to assume then that the decal product was in the right half of that planter. And seed treatments. So it's going to assume that both hybrids have that same seed treatment. If the Mazex hybrid had the Fertenza on it, we'll click done. So now we're able to, to map that as well, confirm. And now I can continue seeding and go from there. So one last thing uh, I want to talk about is that incompatible rate controller that um, we can set up if we just have GPS. So I'm going to go back to my equipment tab and I'm going to switch back to this test sprayer. I was out playing the other day in my car. I needed to get out of the house. So I put my bulb on top of my Ford Explorer and I drove around the neighborhood and uh, I played with a sprayer. So again, I've got 120 foot sprayer in my backyard. I'm going to tap my application here. We'll select that uh, how to test at the top. There's my application. I'm going to confirm that. Again, if I wanted to create that custom map, I could. Here you can see that uh, once I have GPS connection and I have a cell signal on my iPad, I can also get weather information. Uh, which can be key when we're out uh, spraying to, to keep track of. What you notice is different is down at the bottom, I've got this extra box. And this is because I, uh, this is because I don't have that um, rate controller that is telling FieldView to start mapping. So I have to tell FieldView to start creating a map. So I hit that tap to stop. So it uh, was already started and then I tap to start. The one thing with this is it does have, it does recognize previous swaths. So as I go around and spray, if I spray my headlands first and I turn around in those headlands, it's automatically going to stop mapping. Or if I start to get overlap, my sprayer sections are going to start to shut off as I drift or as I move into a, a triangle to finish up a field um, as those sections are turned off. So it's going to recognize previous areas. So I'm not having to constantly tap this start and stop button unless I'm turning outside of, of something that has previously been sprayed. Um, if I go up here to what I did on the weekend and I go, should disconnect from my drive maybe because it won't let me. But Anyway, you can. You, this is a way where we can use the GPS that we already have, and we can connect a field view drive to that. We're probably going to need to talk to our uh, our climate activation specialist uh, and possibly add a harness to plug our drive into in order to make this happen. But it's a way to get more information into our play uh, into our field view account. Um, you know. Uh, Dan talked about it and Andrew talked about it. You know, one thing that farmers do in a lot of cases is uh, put trials in their field. And I know when I was an agronomist, we'd have trials in the field and it was hard to find little stakes in the ground and flags um, when the crop has grown and matured and, and trying to, to find them. Um, with field view, if we can map it, we can create that layer and we know where those layers are. And then we have harvest information that will layer up on top of this and we can go out and uh, do some analysis on it. We can work closely with our consultants and the people that we work with closely to look on, look at things that are working or we want to try something new. And I would encourage you to do that if you're using FieldView is um, use it, put trials out there, you know, something that you've read on Twitter or you've been to a conference and it kind of, hmm, I wonder if that's going to work in my management style or on my farm and, and put it, put it into effect, do some split fields or, or side by sides out there um, replicated across the field 
and then uh, you'll be able to, to measure it at the end of the season. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll also highlight is you can't, once the information is in field view and it's uh, stored in the cloud, it's, uh, you're not gonna get rid of it. You're not gonna delete it. So feel free to go around, touch buttons, add equipment, remove equipment, um, and uh, you, can't, you can't break it. It might crash on you. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight, and I should, is if I do get to a field and um, I don't have a boundary, if I'm connected to my field view drive, I can go down here at the bottom and add new field. And similar to how Andrew identified it uh, on the web is, we'll name it, uh, we'll select a client and a farm and we'll add it. And it's gonna show up in my list or it's gonna, add, it's gonna make it active if I want it to. But you can see here that it has a question mark for a boundary. So it obviously, it's not gonna recognize the boundary, but uh, if we select it, make it active. And now as I spray this field, if I spray around it first, um, that boundary will be created based on the GPS location that I've identified with my sprayer. If I'm not connected to my drive, actually that's another, Good call out I'm going to make. Back to settings. And this is something that if you're having issues with your drive and you call our 1888 support line, is if I go back to my settings and devices and click on that drive, it's going to bring up uh, a few things that you may be asked. So if I go to diagnostics here, this is where I've got some things active that my drive is able to read. If I had a rate controller, um, or if I uh, was connected uh, in a different way, I'd see engine RPMs. If I was actually running, I'd see my application rate, my GPS. So they'd wanna make sure that we have a minimum of one Hertz of, of GPS here. Um, and here, I'm just gonna disconnect my drive. And then if I need to add a field, Click this and down at the bottom, I can go through that same process and add a field. It will show up with that box with a question mark and I would manually have to select it when I go there for the first time in order to create that boundary. And then the last place I'm gonna go is the help button off the home screen. Here we have the support number at the top. I can also submit a ticket from here. So I need to enter my phone number tell me I'm, I'm having issues with my field view drive, describe the problem. And what's gonna happen when I hit the submit ticket is it's gonna send the field files from that last field I was working in with this ticket so that our support um, group has a starting point to start looking and diagnosing that, prob that uh, problem that you're having. The other thing that you may be asked if you do phone that helpline is for the version is information. So what version of FieldView are you running? And here it will be the, the one that's listed at the top, version 9.0.0. And Andrew, that's uh, everything I've got. If there's any questions that came up, I can uh, now go back and answer them on the, uh, on the webinar. Um, and if not, I believe we uh, are turning it back to you. That's right. Well, thanks, Marvin. That was a wonderful overview of Cab App and I think showed us a lot of new opportunities at the same time. Um, so we will now uh, just go into a, a quick um, opportunity. I want to show everybody that was alluding to what you were talking about was the Map Anything Kit. And uh, just to let everybody know, if you're not looking to invest in a full auto guidance system or an upgrade to a piece of equipment, we can make uh, your current uh, tractor and planter or spreader or applicator um, compatible with FieldView through the Map Anything Kit available through Egg Express. It's about $600 US, so give or take on the exchange, about $1,000 uh, Canadian delivered to your door. And it kind of looks like the um, system below. It's, it's a little bit of a different globe, but uh, you've got the drive connection with the harness with the globe. And uh, we can map hybrids, uh, planting populations, uh, fertilizer applications, crop protection applications. And uh, so there is some great opportunity uh, if we want to simply start capturing more data into FieldView 
uh, with the Map Anything kit. So at this point, it will be break time for about five minutes. So uh, my watch says it about 11.25, so we'll come back at 11.30. And uh, here's just some opportunities in front of you. Perhaps you're sitting down just uh, refilling with a coffee, but have a look uh, if you need any uh, additional insight in terms of what you need for an iPad. Uh, there's some information there. Um, just one highlight I'll note is that Wi-Fi only is okay, but we do generally recommend a cellular equipped iPad. Uh, just in case you, you start to think about growing into field view a little bit deeper with remote view or want to use the iPad for scouting more and have a more accurate GPS in the field. Um, but uh, there's some of the requirements we're looking for. And there's also the support available in the most recent app versions uh, just to make sure that you're equipped as we go into the field. So we'll take five minutes from here and uh, we'll reconvene shortly. Thank you.
Okay, everybody. Well, Andrew is back here and um, just want to introduce you to FieldView 201. Uh, we do hope to get completed here within the next 30 minutes. Uh, FieldView 201 does uh, give us an opportunity to get a bit deeper into CAB app reports and some in-depth analysis, uh, as well as to show you a quick remote view and then get into FieldView seed scripts with our own market development agronomist at Bear, uh, Bob Thurwell. And uh, so we'll uh, look forward to helping you get a little bit more out of FieldView as we now graduate from 101 and get into 201. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Dan Demoizak, who's uh, gonna take it uh, from here. All right, thank you very much. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my iPad screen in a second. Essentially what I wanna get you guys through uh, is the, the, the cab app version of our platform. Um, there we go. I'm just gonna share my screen here. We're in business. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to go through the cab app version, uh, more on the, uh, basically reporting, uh, and the, the analysis and also the remote view and kind of things we can get really out of this thing. So the cab app here is on my iPad. Uh, that's the most useful version. There is an iPhone version of this cab app, but we cannot connect it to the drive. So we get some functionality out of it, but it's not like you would out of the iPad. So if you're looking at using the, uh, the drive in the, your piece of equipment, you absolutely need to pair that up with the iPad. Essentially, the drive acts as an antenna and sends the information from your machinery into the iPad, where the iPad basically stores that data. So it processes and stores the data. Uh, which at a later date uh, you can or a later hour if you want you can cloud sync that to your your account so let's get into this in a second let's get this into it so what i want to show you is the analysis and reporting once you've done uh, the work in that field how do you get the information out of there how do you use that information so if we want to go a field by field basis let's say i just want to do individual fields i'm going to click on the map cursor here on the map button here and then from here, let's say I've completed my, my combining here. I've just finished harvesting this, this north field, and I'm, I want to get some information out of it. I want to send some information out. What, here is what we call the more button, the little arrow coming out of the stack here. That's the more button. If I click on here, I can get season summary, harvest summary, because I'm on the harvest or the yield map. If I was on this, uh, basically a different type of map here showing up. Uh, if it was a planting map, I would have a planting summary and so on and so forth. Uh, and I also have a send and print button. So let's go through these very quickly. The first one I wanna show you is the harvest summary, basically this one layer. If I go ahead and click on that one, it gives me all the details of that particular event. So I know how many acres I've har harvested, the average moisture, average yield. Uh, if I start going down here, I see all the different hybrids, how many of each acres each hybrid was in, uh, eight, uh, yields and the average moisture, of course. I can go down to the seed treatment. So I get all these great inf this great information on one page. I also see here my the combine. So I have one combine that's being used. I might have multiple that would show up in here and I can basically adjust them as need be. And of course, add some notes. So once I've got that information in, I wanna get my PDF map. I can create a PDF map from here. And essentially it's the same idea just with the image of that field. And we have the, the actual field itself, when it was done, the, the, the map itself, all the information. So if you're one of those types of people who likes to have you know paper copies of your information, uh, very top corner, you can basically email or print that uh, that map out and put it in your binders. But if you prefer to have a digital version, let's just hit on the done button here. If I click on done, digital version, I would just go right back to here on the more button and I would send or print a copy. Now, this is excellent feature if you're a custom operator. For example, you just finished combining your customer's fields and you want to send their data. Uh, a couple of ways you can do this. So you can send the, the, file, uh, the field files this way, or you can create a map PDF. Essentially, this PDF is what you've seen earlier without all the information. It's just a colored map. That's it. That's all. It's quite basic. Or you can have a screenshot of some uh, event with the clouds or a uh, radar you see on this map and you want to grab a screenshot. That's one way you can do it. I like using this field files uh, tab. So essentially, once you're done combining or done working in that particular field, you would just enter that customer's email address, and then you have two different options here. You send field files and send to account. The difference is if you're sending a field file, you're basically sending a raw data file to their email in which they can basically grab the information and put it into another application. If they're using uh, another platform or another other version, they can go ahead and grab that information and put it into their other platform. Whereas sending to account is if their customer or that other person happens to have a field view account, 
you're essentially sending a photocopy of this information to their account. So it's direct to their account. That's a great feature to work, work on. Now, this is a field by field demo. If you're looking at, say here, this more button again, the next one was the season summary. And again, this is for this one particular location. You want a season summary. And I see all the activities that have happened in this, into this particular field. So I start off with a burn down at a certain date, certain leaders, and I can dig in, see these little arrows here. I can dig in, I want the exact application, all the information, I can go ahead and do that. A quick note on this one is you will see that there's a weather start and finish. Uh, as of this year, those will be automatic uh, areas where if you have internet connection or data on your iPad in that field, the weather start will automatically be uh, generated once you start that pump up in the sprayer. And when you're done that field, the weather end will also be automatically generated. Uh, you can still edit them if need be. You click on them and you can still edit them or you can do it manually. And ag again, you can create that PDF map of all information. But here again, if you want a whole rundown of everything that's happened in those fields, right? I want to know exactly uh, you know, when and how much burn down they did, the soybean planted, the fungicide, the soybeans were harvested, and so on and so forth. All that information can be done in one page. This is an excellent feature when you're reporting your, your herbicides and fungicides and um, pesticides, particularly in the potato production, uh, where you have a whole list of, say, fungicide, and you want to do your Canada Gap reporting. Uh, this is a great spot to grab all that information very, very quickly. Uh, you can go ahead and create a PDF again, if you wish, of all those activities. And then you have all that information that can be sorted across that whole, that whole field. Hitting that done button again. Now, again, this is for one field in particular. If you want to do a little more, you want to grab your whole operation, right? You want to look at, you know, what's happening on the farm. I'm going to go ahead and click on my settings tab down here. And I'm going to click on the data slide. And from here, I can send my field data. So if I want to send that information to uh, my producer or I'm a, I'm a vendor and I want to send it to my customers or whoever I want, I can go ahead and select say, my 2019, put their email address. I can either select all fields or select whichever field I want. And once again, I have those same options, send field files. So again, if that customer or whoever is using another platform, another application, you can just send them a raw dat file and they would basically upload that to their other system. They could either send to account. So once again, if they already have a pre-existing climate field view account, that information can be sent directly to their account. Here's a send a sharing key. If there's a partner platform with field view that can link together called APIs, this is a way we can link those two platforms together via that API. So we'd send a sharing key and would hook those fields into their that platform partner. But again, this is all the producers uh, will. If you're, if you're the producer and you want to share that information, you can go ahead and do so. But until you've actually clicked on that, no information is shared whatsoever. So let's go back to our home button. This is how you would uh, you know, basically share your data. I really like the analysis tab. Again, I wanna look at the, uh, the, the production on my farm, what's happening on my farm as a whole farm, not necessarily field by field, but I wanna see more detail. So I'm gonna click into the analysis tab here. And from this analysis tab, I can look at different areas, whether it's yield, planting, applications, or weather. I can really dig into these. So here's some really great examples. For example, I want to see uh, how much pro line I've used on my farm this year. So I can click on the application, click on 2019, and go by product. So if my retailer has billed me for a certain amount of liters of pro line, and I know I've used a little more or a little less, I can confirm that as long as everything has been mapped. I know that I've used 100.5 liters of ProLine on my farm. Now, does that bill match or not, and why? Where has that been applied? I can still dig in a little bit further if need be and see exactly which fields those were applied in. Uh, another great example is I had one producer in particular was asking, hey, I have a certain hybrid. It's drying down faster than most. Uh, how can I find those particular hybrids on my farm? Because I want to go combine those right now and wait for the other ones. So again, you just go to the yield, or sorry, the, the planting section here. I'm going to go on my corn 2019. I'm going to select my hybrid. And let's say in his case, it was hybrid C that happened to be drying down faster than most. This is the one I want to get to right away, or maybe the, you know, avoid any problems. If I click on here, I see every single field where that hybrid has been planted. And once you get to that field, you could also see, you could also see exactly where it's been mapped and how it's been, where, where it's located in that particular field. Um, once again, uh, it, it's, this is a great way to, let's say I go to application here. This is a great way to grab the information for Canada Gap or any other kind of uh, pesticide uh, application you need be. You can just go ahead and hit applications, let's say by product. Here are all the different products I've used. 
And now I want to share that information. So I can hit, click on share and I can either create a PDF or CSV file. The difference is here, a PDF is essentially a photocopy of this, this information that you would just print out or send out by email on a, on a piece of paper. Whereas if you're using a, uh, another, say, uh, you know, Excel, uh, you know, Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets type of documents, and you want to bring that information into your own personal files, you can select a CSV file, which is, stands for comma separated values. And that is standard, uh, a standard format, which will be imported into a various amount of, uh, of different pages that you're using on the farm already. Um, another way to look at this information is to say you want to go by yield, see what products are yielding best, so on and so forth. But here's an interesting one by seed treatment, right? So as Marvin was showing earlier, we can do different seed treatments. Well, this is where the information can be pulled out, which seed treatment works well for my farm and so on and so forth. And I can really dig into more detail. But another interesting feature is by combine. I want to see which combine has been producing better, which one's off. Here's a great way I can start finding that information. So I think we're running a little short on time. So I'm going to hand the ball back over to Bob Thurwall. Any questions, feel free to ask a question on the comment side. And if not, you can reach us at the 1-800 number and we'd be happy to answer you. Actually, host, if you could hand over the ball to myself and I'll drive the slides as we uh, transition uh, into the section that Bob will be covering. So um, we now have the opportunity to learn a little bit about FieldView seed scripts, uh, formerly known as advanced prescriptions within FieldView. This is a tool that really helps automate and provide efficiencies to uh, providing variable rate populations uh, inside Climate FieldView. And I think it's important, first of all, to step back and understand uh, the science behind scripting. And so I've got uh, Bob Thurwall on the line and, and Bob has lots of experience in uh, variable rate populations and uh, looking at hybrid performance and the development of new hybrids. Uh, he's got over 25 years experience, uh, 14 of those years as an agronomist on the market development team with both DeKalb and Bear. And uh, he's responsible for the tech support of DeKalb, corn and soybeans and bear crop protection. And so uh, we'd like to introduce uh, Bob here today. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks. It's great to be on here this morning and provide a little bit of insight, some of the background work that our market development team has done over the years to help build the information that goes into building this. I want to start off with a quote from Fred Beadle. If you have uh, maybe heard or seen Fred Beadle speak, he's from the University of Illinois. And he's gone through and built uh, one of the projects he worked on was the Seven Wonders higher core yields, and one of the quotes I had was, higher plant populations are one of the most important ways to achieve the highest possible core yield. I just want to start off with uh, that thought, and we'll, we'll look into some of the things we've learned over the years of our trial work in Ontario. Some of the background things to think about for higher population, and uh, we know that as we increase plant density, we typically our yield gains. And uh, those yield gains have come from a number of different areas. Sometimes it's new traits that we've offered, whether it's new um, you know, some of the different technologies that our breeding group is continuing to uh, use in their trial. We've also learned that germplasm, different genetics or germplasm response differently to various populations. And so that's really our, been our goal um, in our trial work is to figure out which hybrids respond more to higher populations and which ones have the agronomic attributes to uh, to hold up those higher populations things like stock stock quality harvest uh, harvest appearance at the end of the season and um, we've also learned that higher yield environments or those higher yield zones of the field are the areas that show a greater response to higher populations that is compared to those lower yield zones um, in different areas of the field. So in our bird market development team, our research farms that we have across Ontario and Quebec, we've done a number of uh, hybrid trials from 2011 to 2019, so about nine years of data. 
we tested over a thousand uh, commercial hybrids and over 5,000 replicated trials. And so we've done this, we've got uh, multiple years of data on each hybrid. We always try to get at least two years, uh, sometimes three years of data per hybrid. And uh, the, the data that we create really shows which hybrids respond to higher populations. And so some of the details we take into consideration um, are the agronomics of the hybrid, so standability, so damage stocks and, and root lodging is part of this, this equation. We also use the cash price for corn as well as the cost of seed. And we factor those things in to, to offer the best economic population for each individual hybrid. And then all the local data is combined from our market development team. And we use that data to, to fuel the seed scripts portion within Climate Field View. This is just a quick look. It's kind of a busy slide, but it shows all the data that has been calculated from 2011 to 19. It shows the, the population trials that we started at 23,000 all the way up to 50,000. And these are a thousand different hybrids with 5,000 different data points for multiple years. And it just shows that yield trend that as we increase population, typically we do increase yield. And then the, um, I guess we'll go to the next slide, Andrew. I'll, I'll talk about the table on the next slide. You give us a little more detail. Okay, so I just wanted to use a couple of examples. Maybe this will help explain some of the differences that we see in genetic response. The, uh, the graph on the left, is uh, DKC4856, a hybrid that you may be familiar with. It's a very uh, high volume product for us across Ontario and Quebec. And on the top line there, the red line, you can see there's pretty much a straight response in yield when we increase population. So with this particular hybrid, if you increase population, it's gonna respond just about every time, year in and year out. At the bottom of the table there, of the bottom of the graph, you can also see an orange line that is flat from 27 to 32,000 and starts to increase a little bit as you get into that 42.5 to 47. And that's a total of the damaged plants. So it combines uh, root lodging and stock lodging at harvest. And that's an important part because we know growers don't want to uh, push population and get, get higher yields while having say 30% stock, stock lodging. So so that total damage plants is certainly a consideration in our best economic recommendation. And if you look at the table below that chart, you, we have uh, what we call yield optimum, and that's really the highest watermark for yield on that graph above. So you'll see that's 263 bushel at 49,000. But then again, using the seed cost, um, the cost of the, of the corn itself, so say $5 corn and $300 bag, Best economic rate is 42,100. That takes into consider those, <clears throat> the economic. If we look at the chart on the right, we've got 3855. You can see a flatter line for the yield response there by population. The thing I wanted to point out on this hybrid on the bottom is those damaged plants. And so you can see once you get over 37,500, that line goes pretty steep and we get into that 18% uh, damaged plants or so. And so again, that, that comes into consideration when we make our best economical recommendations. So you can see the table below, the uh, yield optimum or the highest yield is 39, 9,000 per population, but the economic recommendation is 35.3. So again, those are just some of the background details of the information we've gathered um, that goes into the, the seed scripting portion. slow response Andrew or not yeah I think it's just a little delayed Bob but I 
There we go. I won't go into to this in too much detail. Andrew, I think you're going to cover this mostly. But this really gives us a bit of a, a shot when we're in the uh, seed scripting portion. You can put in your target yield there of 205. You can put your own seed cost in. You can put your own grain price in. And then you can also adjust the number of zones. And Andrew, I'll let you uh, take that away. And in your portion, just that slider bar on the right hand side where you can change to either. If you think you want to increase the yield estimates, you can just simply use that slider bar. And that will uh, change all your population recommendations in tandem uh, for those different zones. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you just want to give some fun comments here on the uh, seed script multi hybrid trial that you conducted using the seed scripts tool. In so just to finish up here. So this is just a quick look, um, a split screen of a seed script that I did for a fellow north uh, south of London in 2018. This is a little more complex than uh, than we generally do, but. This is for our four row uh, research planner and I designed a multi hybrid. Um, script for a fella looking at um, different hybrids and then we put some static strips in as well, just as testers. But really just wanted to give you the idea that um, if you look on the left hand side that you can see the different rates or the population zones in there from 30,000 up to 38. On the right hand side, that just is a, a picture of the different. Um, Multi hybrid uh, sections that we had for planting. But really, this is a pretty complex uh, script that we did. And even a guy like me that's not real techie, we did it in less than 10 minutes. It was very straightforward. It could make adjustments by his own. And again, Andrew will, uh, will showcase that in his little demo here, too. But I just wanted to give you a feel that really, um, you know, a simplified variable rate seed script is quite straightforward. And probably less than five minutes you can do for each field, even with making a few adjustments uh, to tailor it to your own situation. So that's really a, a wrap up for me. I just wanted to give you a quick insight on some of the trial work that, that does go into building the seed scripts. It is based on local Ontario and Quebec data um, for the decalb hybrids that we're using. And uh, I think really helps build some of the uh, confidence in the population work that's being offered there. So I'll pass it back to you, Andrew. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Bob. Really appreciate uh, the insight and the experience that we can draw from on today's webinar. Um, and uh, I think it really helps us understand a little bit more about uh, why seed scripting can generate more value uh, for corn growers. So. Uh, to now transition and uh, go into a, uh, a live demonstration. And so I'm going to go back to my uh, FieldView account here. And um, I'm going to uh, click up here to prescriptions. And uh, I'm then going to go and uh, select the field that I'll want to uh, generate a prescription on. So uh, up here is my list of fields. I'm going to go into demo seed scripts. And uh, you'll be able to see here that I can do a fertility prescription, which would be a manual prescription, or I can do a, uh, a planting prescription. And if I would made previous prescriptions as well, they are listed here. So I'm just going to go down here and go create new. And I'm going to collect corn. But if I click soybeans, advanced says corn only, uh, we can make a manual planting prescription if we had gone here. So. Um, the advanced prescriptions are those that are really generating those recommendations based on uh, everything uh, Bob had uh, just gone through with us. So the next thing it does is it really looks at now that we've got all our data in one place, which layers of data do we want to use to be able to generate this prescription? And I think, again, this is where data quality really comes into play. So if we knew, for instance, that we had data going from 2016 to 2019, and we know there are some gaps, and so perhaps in 2019, for whatever reason, we didn't have the crop selected, but we knew it was soybeans, we could put in soybeans there. And then in 2016, um, perhaps we knew this to be a wet field, and we ended up tiling this. Um, and so perhaps we wanted to remove um, that layer for that reason as an example. 
and wanted to generate the script off of three years of field health imagery and two years of da yield data, including one bean corn. Uh, what we need as a minimum is three years of field health imagery, including one of those years with corn or two years of yield data, including one of them as corn. That's really our minimum starting point. So the more data layers we can put in, the better and the more accurate that this uh, script will be recommended as. So I'm going to go next. I'm going to propose that we have a, an earlier spring this year, my proposed planting date. We're going to remain at April 30th. Uh, I'm also going to then select my hybrid. So we, we can select really any hybrid and uh, it'll provide a recommendation whether we have a, a cow tested hybrid or whether it's a competing hybrid as an example. Um, but the DeKalb ones have been tested using that uh, set of data that Bob had just uh, told us about. So if I wanted to do one like uh, DKC uh, 4982 uh, as an example, and we wanted to put in a target yield of uh, 205 bushels, and uh, our seed cost per bag is estimated at $300, and our estimated grain price is at $5. Um, now we're going to click Next, and now it's building my seed script for me, okay? So it's recommended three zones, including one that has a very uh, small zone to it, and you can see that the different population rates have been recommended here. Now, if you ever get concerned that these are much higher than what you've ever done, um, there is an opportunity to update them when we go finish an editor. But uh, it'll be important to, uh, to first think about, do we want to make any broader and automated adjustments here in this view? So perhaps I want to expand this from three to five zones as an example, and it'll automatically uh, take that information and now uh, generate a different script. So you can see it's really starting to tease out some of those uh, higher yielding zones from those lower yielding zones and giving me a bit more detail now. The other thing is, is we can use this slider bar and go higher estimated yield and it'll update those populations um, and probably generate them a little bit higher than what we saw. Now we can see our highest one is about 39.9. I think it was at about 38 before we did that. And then our lowest is about 34.6. If I go lower investment, uh, we'll see uh, the opposite happen where we're basically bringing those populations down. Now our highest is about 37.4 and our uh, lowest is 32.2. The nice part is, is we can always go back to some of these changes. So it's changing those edits as I've made them here. So I'm just going to go back to the original uh, recommended one, but I'm going to now change that from three zones to four. And I'm going to now finish this in editor. So let's finish that in editor. And uh, I know that zone one is very small. And so perhaps I want to uh, merge that zone with zone two. So that's um, one of the first things I'm going to do. So I believe it's uh, this one here and uh, in this one. And we're going to uh, go save. And now we've uh, we've merged that zone. And, uh, and now maybe uh, I want to uh, give this a different value. So maybe my estimate is that that will be 190 bushel and uh, I'll want to put 34,000 here. Okay. Next, what I want to do is I want to draw a zone. And the reason why I want to draw a zone is often you may hear that uh, when prescriptions are done, it's always important to have check blocks to understand uh, how did you, what you were traditionally doing compare to the new prescription. So. If I wanted to draw a, uh, a polygon in one of the higher areas, and what would be helpful actually is uh, if I zoomed in a little bit further here. So I'm just going to go back and go draw. Uh, well, actually, we're going to draw a square. A uh, square block will be easier to uh, to generate. So it automatically gives me a square. I'm going to shrink that down, and um, now I'm going to go save, and that will give me a uh, another zone. The zone is automatically highlighted over here, and uh, I'm going to go in and estimate at 200 bushels. And uh, my traditional um, rate might have been 33,000, and so let's uh, put that population rate in there. And then another thing I'll want to do maybe is is draw another square, and. Uh, 
I'm going to put that one in this red zone here. And um, maybe I want to just test and see if I go up to 36,000 on this particular block. Um, did that actually generate a higher return or didn't it? And so um, perhaps I want to bring this one up to 36,000 and I'll just put 200 in here as a reference. And uh, and now I can I can see I'm basically doing the inversion just to do some testing as we go and uh, test out this seed script for its own performance. Now I can see down here I've averaged population at 35,800 seeds per acre. Again, if I make these appropriate adjustments here, that will come down. Um, this is about 17 bags of seed for this field. And now I'm going to save this prescription. Okay, so that script was successfully saved. Now, one of the things you might want to do is say, well, what does that look like versus our most recent yield map? Here we can go change map view, and I can look at that 2018 corn yield map and start to align my boundaries with the higher yielding zones that we saw back in 2018. And so this is just a, a ground truthing exercise for helping you understand the science behind the zone creation that this program has done for us. And so what we're able to see is that, yes, lower yielding zone over here, higher yielding zone over here, and it's taking a few areas out as well um, to, uh, to consider what was done previously in terms of uh, yield maps and field health imagery addressing the variability in this field. Now we'll go back to our population rate on the current prescription, and um, now we'll wanna export that. Now, if we're using a 2020 monitor uh, with precision planting, then we can simply save this, close it. It will sync back with our iPad and we'll pull it back from Cab App directly into the 2020 um, with the iPad. But if we're uh, using another uh, program, say connect to my John Deere as an example, and there's a modem in the, the planter tractor, we can connect that wirelessly with this prescription or if we want to look at any other type of uh, setup, we can then find the appropriate file. Uh, could be an ag leader shape file, a generic shape file, a John Deere prescription file, even Precision 2020, what have you, Pro 700, Trimble FMX. And we can export those files into uh, a USB drive after downloading them to our desktop. So I'm going to select a John Deere file in this case. I'm going to download it and it's going to download itself to uh, my desktop and uh, we're going to be able to have access to that prescription to then save it to a USB and take it directly uh, to the display in the planter tractor. So I'm now going to close this and um, if I wanted to make a new prescription and do one with fertility as an example, um, I could do that here. I could also um, generate a soybean prescription and, and do that here. And it's a very similar process. It's just not creating the zones uh, the same way that the advanced planting prescription did. So it will just take a little bit more time. Okay, so we're gonna quit um, making our prescriptions now. And uh, just to, uh, to wrap things up, um, I'll take you back to my slide presentation as this is uh, really concluding um, this webinar today. And so the one thing I want to highlight is, first of all, that you can um, select your fields by going to the buy section and purchasing the field view seed scripts for corn. So they are $1.50 per acre, and um, you have to select those fields and pre-buy them. You're basically upgrading those fields to pro and that you would like to make a seed script for, and then you can go ahead and use the tool that I've just showed you. Now, we understand that as you get into scripting, um, sometimes you might want to uh, have more of a try it before you buy an approach. And so we've actually created a promo code for users here today, uh, and it's called Canid vscript150. So the A is dropped off of Canada there, and then it's vscript150. That gives you basically $150 for 100 acres of FieldView seed scripts and uh, can really get you comfortable with that tool and, uh, and get you using uh, some of these seed scripts in uh, 2020 as you look to evaluate uh, these for yourself. So hope that was clear, go into buy, select your fields, pay for them up front, 
use the promo code, and then you'll be able to uh, create the seed scripts from there. So with that, uh, one word of encouragement I just want to give everybody on the call is, is whether you're a dealer, whether you're a grower, just think about how we can do things a bit differently in, in 2020. What does FieldView enable us to trial, whether it's a, a tillage trial, whether it's a seed treatment trial, whether it's a fungicide trial, or looking at split planter with different hybrids on either side and really starting to learn what are our fields telling us and what can we do differently perhaps in 2021 with key learnings on data science on our own farms in 2020. And so just, just think about that and what's possible. Uh, you know, we've got lots of support available. Um, if you want to uh, reach out to uh, any of us, please do so. Uh, you can uh, see the, the 1-800 number on the top of the screen there, as well as support at Climate and our Twitter handle at, at FieldView Canada. And uh, if you want to get a hold of myself or Dan directly, um, you know, we're more than happy to uh, support you as well. And uh, those following contacts can definitely refer you to us as well. So I want to thank you for participating on the webinar today. Thank you for your questions. If you have questions, feel free to uh, drop us a line and uh, we'll be sure to follow up if it didn't get answered here today. So thank you very much.